now because it's about well, almost eight past. So I, I think you've already learned quite a bit about Bob Johnston in the last few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think it's my job to give a more formal introduction. It's a real pleasure to welcome Bob from the Department of Biology at Johns Hopkins University. Um, when you look at his CV, it's really scary because he was incredibly productive as both a graduate student and a postdoc. And his output is characterized not just by the number of papers, but by the sheer impre impressive quality of them. And by quality, I, I also mean the amazing breadth of them because he covers things from you know very hardcore developmental biology to things like chromosome pairing, um, issues that one would normally, that kind of breadth you normally might not encounter in the lifetime of a scientist's career. But anyway, uh, Bob was a graduate student with Oliver Hobart where he worked on left-right asymmetry in C. elegans. Uh, then he worked as a postdoc in Claude Desplan's lab, where he worked on this very interesting problem of how the R7 and R8 cells um, decide which opsin they're going to express. So a subset of R7 cells, of a, sort of a fixed ratio, express one opsin, rhodopsin three, and the remainder express rhodopsin four, uh, and while the ratio is predictable, it's a stochastic choice as to how each cell decides what it does. And, and Bob did some very nice work figuring out how that choice is made. And he also then did work on a little bit of work on the coordination between the R7 cell and the R8 that sits below it uh, on how they coordinate opsin expression. So when he set up his own lab, he, in, a, in another bold move, decided to study the specification of cone cells uh, in a subset of vertebrate photoreceptor cells. And, and again, the breadth of approaches is really striking. You know, he's using organoids, he's studying the impact of hormonal regulation and other extrinsic factors, again, thinking about stochastic sulfate choices. So take it away, Bob. It's a real pleasure to have you here at Berkeley. Thank you so much for that uh, awesome introduction. Thank you to Roberto and Elchin and Polina for inviting me. And thanks for coming out today. Um, this is my first time doing one of these virtual seminars. Uh, so be a little patient with me. Um, the other thing is, you know, I, uh, oh, let me start the share here. I, uh, you know, very much typically invite questions during my talk. So again, feel free to ask questions. Um, here we go. Hold on one second. Um, you know, either in the chat or you can just, you know, there's, I don't think there'll be so many questions. If you want to unmute yourself and interrupt me, that's totally cool. Um, yeah. And I'm super, super excited to be here. Let me just get going here. There we go. All right. Um, and so today, what I'm going to be talking about is how we get the different cells in our eye that can de detect colors. And so my career for the most part, there we go, has focused kind of on a question that's been around for a long time. And this question is how we get the different kind of neurons in our nervous system. And you know, to me, one of the first and one of the most beautiful examples of this kind of studies was by Cajal and his be beautiful stains in which he, in this case, looked at the vertebrate eye. So kind of in that tradition, in my lab, we study two main model systems. We study uh, the fruit fly eye, which is on the left, and we study the human eye on the right. And both of these, the pictures I'm showing you here, are color vision systems. So in short, there are two main types of color detectors in the fruit fly eye, and these are randomly distributed across the eye. And in humans, there are three types of cone cells that detect either red, green, or blue light. And so, you know, my lab, um, our, the, all of our work kind of is rooted on these patterns. And we start with this question and we say, okay, you know, where will the biology lead us? And we ask, you know, we've, over the years, we've asked a series of different questions and most of them are around the central question of how do cells choose fates? In other words, how does this blue cell know how to be a blue cell? How does this know how to be a red cell? And the same kind of questions now in humans where how does this blue, red and green cone cell know what type to be? To get at this, We've explored, you know, uh, sources of natural variation. We've asked questions of what the role of these different cell types are in vision and behavior. 
Uh, we've asked questions about nuclear architecture and chromatin structure. And one of the big things we've asked more recently is what can we learn about human biology? So together, kind of asking these smaller questions, it's now moving forward, um, you know, as a lab, we're, the, the lab in general is focused on three very big questions. And these are, how do cells randomly choose between fates? How are the cells in the human eye specified? And in this way, when we say this, the cells, again, today I'm gonna to tell you about the three cone cells, but the ultimate goal that, that I hope to achieve in my lab is to basically figure out all the hundred or so subtypes of neurons in the eye. And ultimately where we're gonna go with this is to ask the question, can we reconstitute the human visual system in the dish? And again, these are very early days. Um, and what we want to do is to be able to grow a human retina and a human brain organoid and connect them and then use that as a model system to study the development of human vision. But again, I just wanna preface this by saying these are very early days. And today what I'm gonna focus on is the human system and how we get these three different cone uh, photoreceptor subtypes. So the, what this is, is a picture of the back of your eye, the retina. And so light enters your eye here and it hits a structure in the back called the retina. And again, there are these three types of cone cells. Um, very simply for this talk, I'll call them again, the, the blue, the red and the green cells. And when we started this work about five or six years ago, you know, uh, there was a, let's say limited knowledge of how this system worked. The main model in the field was that it was a two-step process. In step one, there was a decision for these cones to be either the blue type or the red-green type. And if they choose this red-green path, there was a second choice to be either red or green. And I just wanna emphasize, it's not thought that this was some kind of hybrid state, it was just that it was going down this pathway. So today what I'm gonna tell you is one published story about decision one and one story that is still in progress, but we're, we're near the end, but it's, there's still a couple experiments we're finishing up on decision two. So decision one we published about two years ago now, uh, really awesome work by a fantastic grad student in the lab, Kiara Eldred. She has now gone on to Tom Ray's lab to pursue her, pursue her postdoctoral work. And I'm very grateful to Kiara because she was the first member of my lab that stepped out from flies and started this organoid work in the lab. And for me, you know, when I started my lab, I was really inspired. I had seen a talk in 2012 by a really fantastic scientist named Yashiki Sasai. And what Yashiki had developed was a system originally in mouse and then later applied in humans to take stem cells and differentiate them into human retinal tissue. And I just thought, what a fantastic system to now go ahead and study how cells in the human eye are made. And so what we do is, oh, and sorry, and I, I, before I continue, I have to just thank Don Zach and Carl Whalen, collaborators at JHMI that helped me get this system up and running in my lab. And so what we do is we take either IPS or ES stem cells. We do what's called a force aggregation, which is the very fancy name for saying, letting them fall to the bottom of a tube and clump up. Then we add a series of developmental agonists and antagonists, which then induce neural, uh, neural uh, structures to start to develop. And then by day eight, these start to now differentiate into primitive retinal tissue. At this point, we physically dissect these. So on this organoid now, you have actually four different retinal tissues growing. We dissect them off, so each of them are growing individually. And then by day 43, you see one of my favorite pictures, um, which is you see a human retina growing in a dish. You see the, the multiple nuclear layers and the noticeable curvature, kind of, um, you know, what we see of the human retina. And so this is great. And coming from flies and um, uh, worms before that during my career, we we're like, okay, day 43, let's start to do some experiments. Uh, but humans are a little bit different. They take a little bit longer to develop. Any of the parents that are listening to this talk will understand that, particularly the mothers particularly will understand this. So these experiments, Kiara really had to push beyond what was, had been done previously. So she grew these organoids out to day 281, 329 and beyond. So she grew these organoids out for a full year. And at first, you know, we were worried. These are, these are done in antibiotic free conditions. 
uh, and yet we have to obviously keep them from being contaminated. And when we saw this fuzz, at first we were a little concerned that maybe these were getting contaminated. But what we realized and we were excited about are these are actually structures called the outer segments. And what that means is the photoreceptors are growing or being differentiated at the outside layer. And these are structures that are reaching out from the photoreceptors. And these are the light detecting structures of those cone cells. So we were happy about this. And next we want to know, okay, do we get the cone cells? So to test this, we used antibody staining against uh, the blue opsin or S opsin and the red green cone opsin or LM opsin. And I just want to emphasize that the, and you'll see a little bit later that the red and green opsin are extremely similar. So we don't have an antibody to distinguish between them. But for this first decision, it doesn't matter since we're choosing between the blue and the red green fake. So what we were excited to see when we stained is this beautiful array of uh, blue and red green cells. So from there, we next wondered, okay, great. Well, we get these red green, you know, we get these blue and these red green cells, but can we use this as a system to study developmental biology? Maybe we're just getting these cells, you know, kind of haphazardly, you know, what do we know? And so we actually don't know a ton about the developmental biology of the system, but there's really pioneering work, really pioneering uh, human fetal anatomical work from Anita Hendrickson, you know, a real leader in this field. And what she had found by careful study was very simple, that the blue cells were made first and that the red green cells were made later. So what Chiara wondered is, okay, do the organoids recapitulate this? And indeed they do. So what she saw was that around day 150, she saw the blue cones, but no red green cones. At day 190, the population of blue cones remains fairly stable. And now she starts to see more red green cells. And then by day 290, we see even more red green cells kind of reaching a terminal state of a population where it's predominantly red green with some blue cells. So when she did this experiment for a full year, what she saw was in early time points, she saw no expression of these opsins. At around day 150, we now see blue cones only. And this more or less levels off throughout the rest of the development. And at this time point, we start to now see the specification of red green cones. So cool, this gave us an idea that we could use this system to study human developmental biology. And so, okay, so this recapitulates the timing, but of course the next question is, well, what's controlling this process? And so to get at this, we turn to like the, the years and years of awesome work in model systems. First, we turn to the mouse and then we turn to the fish. And you can see these, what I'm showing you right now are the cone patterns in these different organisms. And it's fairly obvious to see that these are very different kinds of patterns. You know, this, to me at least, and to others, this kind of looks like Starry Night here with the mouse, whereas the fish has this amazing, almost perfect uh, lattice grid. But we knew from both of these systems was that a nuclear receptor called THR beta, or thyroid hormone receptor beta, was critical for cone subtype specification. And so we wondered, okay, we made a hypothesis that thyroid hormone receptor beta would activate the red-green fate and repress the blue cones. And our, the prediction that Chiara and I had was that if we now knock this out, we might generate human retinas with an increase in the population of the blue cones. And so Chiara did this experiment. Again, we, con we grow control organoids with every experiment we do. In the controls, again, we see our mix of blue and red-green cones. And now in this thyroid hormone receptor beta null mutant, we saw a really a striking phenotype where we generated human retinas that only had blue cones. So great. So this is telling us now that this receptor is required for red green cone fate. So of course the next question is, well, what regulates thyroid hormone receptor beta? And this comes in the form of thyroid hormone whose active form is called T3. And so our hypothesis now is that, okay, if thyroid hormone receptor beta is driving the generation of red green cones, it's likely acting late and that T3 would be acting late to drive that cell fate. So what Chiara what next wondered is, okay, what if we now supplement or add T3 early? Could we kind of push that timeline forward and perhaps generate more red green cones? So again, Chiara did the control experiment with organoids that generated blue and red green cones. And now when she added T3 early and throughout development, she generated human retinal tissue that only had, or almost only had, red-green cones. 
So together, at this point, what we said is, okay, well, this T3 thyroid hormone is acting through THR beta to activate red green fate and repress blue fate. But, you know, probably many of you here work in model systems. Um, you know, but the, the next question I had, which was a little bit confusing to me was, okay, you know, where is this T3 coming from? Because, you know, it's a thyroid hormone, but there's no thyroid gland in the dish. You know, so how could this be working? And so, you know, this puzzled us for a while. And what we realized is there's very scant levels of T4, the inactive form, and T3, the active form of thyroid hormone in the media. But the fact that our wild type organoids could then change these levels to give these sulfates suggested that the, somehow the retina itself must be controlling the levels of thyroid hormone signaling. So to address this issue, Kiara teamed up with another uh, talented grad student in the lab, Sarah Hadniak, and together they, they did a long time series of bulk RNA-seq of organoids across development. And what the idea is, you know, would there be enzymes that perhaps would lower thyroid hormone signaling early and increase thyroid hormone signaling late? And so um, let me just tell you a little bit about the uh, pathway, just a, a couple details. Again, T3 is the active form of thyroid hormone. This drives, uh, you know, this uh, is bound by this nuclear receptor to drive red green fate. And T3, T3 comes from an inactive form called T4. And there's an enzyme called diaonase 3 or DIO3 that degrades both forms. And our prediction is that if we have low thyroid hormone signaling early, that we might have high DIO3 signaling um, initially, which would decrease thyroid hormone signaling, giving us the blue cells. So um, indeed, this is what we saw. What we see is this dramatic uh, high expression of DIO3, which decreases over developmental time. So this might end with the idea that when you have DIO3, you're degrading thyroid hormone to give the blue cells. And so this might be enough on its own, but indeed it's a little bit more complicated. So T4 is converted to T3 by an enzyme called diaonase 2 or DIO2. And our prediction here is the opposite, that DIO2 should increase over time to drive thyroid hormone signaling and give the red green cells. And indeed, this is what we see. We see roughly correlating with the, the change in the specification, we see an increase in DIO2 expression. And so, um, and again, this is consistent with the idea that DIO2 would convert T4 to T3, driving this red green cone cell phase. So right now we have, you know, we kind of concluded this first story with the following model. Early on in development, we have expression of DIO3. This is degrading T4 and T3 providing a low thyroid hormone signaling environment and giving us these blue cone fates. Over time, we have naive cones are born because they have low thyroid hormone signaling, they're gonna take on the blue fate. As time goes on, DIO3 is gonna decrease. There's gonna be T4 at very low levels in the media. DIO2 will then be turned on to convert T4 to T3, which will then when new naive cones are born, they'll see this high T3, this high thyroid hormone signaling, and take on the red green fate. So currently, Christina McNerney in the lab is following up on this hypothesis and trying to figure out which cells are expressing these enzymes and how they're temporally controlled. So before I move on to the, the next part, what I'll just tell you is, you know, the big question is, what does this mean for vision? And, you know, the reality is when you have major thyroid issues, um, you know, kind of color vision may be lower on your list of concerns, but there is, there are some anecdotal evidence that supports this directly in humans that basically um, infants that are born prematurely that have thyroid issues have a, have a link to vision dysfunction, suggesting indeed that in, in real human development that this thyroid hormone specification is important for uh, normal vision. So just to conclude this first part, what I've shown you is that organoids recapitulate human retinal development, that thyroid hormone signaling controls cone subtype specification in humans. And finally, you know, kind of the, the, what was very exciting about this was this really advanced retinal organoids as a model to study mechanisms of human development. You know, up to this point there, you know, there's been a, tons of fantastic work developing different types of organoids 
But this was one of the first kind of uses of organoids as a model system to then study human development. Um, and what, as a lab, what we continue to do is now use this system to try to understand other questions about human eye development. So before I go to the next part, does anybody have any questions? So I'm still, hi, Bob. Uh, I'm a little hi, confused uh, still about how you got the, if the thyroid is really so important for this, uh, this phenotype, how you got it to recapitulate in the, in the Petri dish. Yeah, so this is, this is one of the, the actual metabolism is still one of the puzzles. So what we know is that there are kind of very low levels in the media. And so we change the media about every two days. So we're constantly replenishing this low level right? And what we think is that the enzymes themselves that are found in the retina are the ones that can actually either degrade it, so you're getting essentially no or very limited signaling, or activate it so you can get higher signaling later. So I had a question. In metamorphosis of frogs, thyroid hormone plays a very important role. I'm kind of curious whether the eye development changes when, or the cone and rod thing, whatever, these color change with, with metamorphosis in a frog. Yeah, so this, there is some work. Um, I don't think, so Dom Brown at Carnegie has done some of this. Uh, I think he's done this, some of this work in, in, in Xenopus in terms of eye development, if I remember right, um, uh, with thyroid hormone. But I, I honestly am blanking a little bit about the relationship of the metamorphosis to the eye development. Um, the one nice thing, so there's a lot of pros and cons with this system. Uh, one of the pros is that we get a lot, we get around a lot of lethality and other issues because it's just the eye growing in the dish. Um, so how this relates to, to other developmental events, you know, it's still kind of a mystery. Um, long term, what we want to do is kind of relate it to other neural development, but in terms of kind of whole organism development, you know, that's a that's a bigger question that will will be really tough to to study in humans. I have a, I have a question. Um, yeah. I was under the impression that uh, short wavelength cones had some sort of regular or semi-regular array like uh, to them. Uh, does your mechanism here at all give you a way to create that grid-like structure? It seems like this sort of, uh, you know, just there's some thyroid hormone in the bath mechanism would produce a pretty random array of cones. Yeah, this is a great question. So, um... Yeah, so the, this just a, this is a great question about the patterning of the cones. So just to reiterate the question, the, the relationship of the blue to red green cones is the blue is kind of in this semi-regular array in humans. The interesting thing is that the red green cones I'm about to talk about, it's believed that they're random. And this is actually the reason we got into all these studies because I studied this in flies, this randomness. And what you'll see is that we kind of are moving away from the randomness in, in the human red green choice. But to get back to your question, how we get this grid, we don't know. What I will say is the, the organoid is a great system. It makes the cell types. But as you can see, even in this picture here, you know, it's very heterogeneous. It's not even close to the regularity of a human um, retina. And so part of that, to a couple different things, right? One is, as we study these, these tissues, what we often look for are ratiometric relationships between cells because absolutes are very hard to do in these organoids. Cause you don't, you know, if you said, oh, if I scored down here versus up here, you know, we score the whole organoid and we do the relative um, number of cells to other cells. In terms of the positioning, um, what happens is that the eye develops in waves. And so what we think is that perhaps the blue cells are being laid down in a wave and, but they're just spatially more separated and that perhaps the red greens are just kind of inserting in between. Um, we don't know yet. This is something we'll probably have to model moving forward. Um, what I will tell you is this, is that um, if you're familiar with the fovea, um, is that we see what we think is some conversion of blue cones into red green cones in the fovea and perhaps even in the periphery of the retina. But these are still uh, kind of ongoing work. All right, excellent questions. Does that, anybody, else, anybody else have any questions or else I'll move on to the next part? Uh, I think Elchin put a question into the chat, which is- Oh, sorry, I missed does, it. How does the timing of cone subtype specification compare between organoid versus normal retinal development? 
Yeah, great question. So the, the question is, what about timing? So the timing seems slower. Um, I could get into some of the reasons why we think that, um, but it scales. So in other words, like the, the developmental events seem to line up well, even if they're not quite the same exact timing. We're still trying to figure out part of this. Um, in the second part of the talk, I'll actually address this part of this directly. Um, again, you know, we have to, without getting out the details, we have to set them on the path of retinal development. And for the most part, we just have them in kind of basal media to feed them. And we, what we don't know is the differences in timing in terms of the, the duration of the timing. Is that just because, you know, we're growing a retina in a dish and it's not in its normal environment or are we missing something, et cetera? So we just don't know the answer to that quite yet. But what I will say is, again, we think of this more in relationship of, you know, we, we constantly kind of have to think about this in terms of the relationship between events rather than the, the ultimate timing or number. Awesome. All right. So if there are no other questions, thanks for the questions, by the way. Um, and I will now move on to the next section. So what I've talked about is this story that we have out, a, you know, a year or two ago now on decision one. And the next one I'm going to tell you about is decision two. And this is the real reason we got into this system, because this is human specific. And I just want to emphasize that our goal in my lab is really to address, you know, human development. You know, there's a many amazing colleagues that are doing fantastic work in mouse and zebrafish to answer big basic questions that you know their system is is the best right because it's a real living system you know we kind of take advantage of this particular system to address questions that are human specific that's our ultimate goal and this question is what got us into this and again this is ongoing work so it's going to be an incomplete story today but i think we've made interesting uh advances and i'd love to get any feedback so, uh, and by the way, this is work by a talented grad student. I mentioned her name earlier. She had worked a, a bit on the first decision, but this is work from Sarah Hadniak. And when we entered this field, there were two main models in the field, uh, kind of the dogma model, which is that this choice is stochastic. And then there was a kind of a lesser known model that this decision was a temporally based developmental process. And so the evidence for the stochastic model came from uh, Jeremy Nathans, who actually cloned all these opsin genes. And what he found was that these two genes, the red and the green opsin genes are located close by on the X chromosome. And there is a, an enhancer or a DNA regulatory element called a locus control region or an LCR. And his data using transgenes in mice suggested a mechanism whereby this LCR might randomly loop to the red opsin or randomly loop to the green opsin. And this was excellent work, especially considering the, you know, I mean, really fantastic work considering the technology at the time. But of course it was limited because you had to use uh, heterologous systems to study this question. Um, other data from other groups, and this is a bit more sparse, but suggested a different model in which the blue cones came first, which we've already discussed, followed by the green cones, and then finally the red cones. And so when we entered this game, you know, we, we uh, Sarah went on many different kind of journeys within this, but ultimately we came, came back to one big question, which is how are red and green opsin expressed during retinal development? We had to come back to a very, very simple question. And we were very fortunate that uh, data sets published by Hoshina et al. and uh, Pinelli et al. Uh, came out studying, uh, again, this is in bulk RNA-seq, looking at um, expression. And you might say, well, okay, what's the big deal? You know, you're just looking at some expression of two genes. But the challenge here is that these genes are highly similar as you're about to see. But going into this, we based on these two models, we had two main predictions. One is if this is a stochastic model, well, these green and red opsins should turn on at about the same time. Because if one cell says, I'm gonna be a green cell, it would express the green opsin. If the next cell said, I'm gonna be red, green, green, red, whatever, ultimately those opsins should relatively come on at the same time. However, if there is more, if temporal mechanisms played a bigger role, we would predict that perhaps one opsin would be expressed before the other opsin. And so the technical challenges are how similar these are. So this isn't quite the right word here, SNP. I think um, uh, Sarah and I have used this for a while. We, we haven't changed, I, I haven't changed the slide over yet, but um, that these are basically differences. And you can see that 
the, at the mRNA level, these are over 95% identical. So for years, nobody's been able to visualize the difference between these two RNAs. Um, or do this uh, bioinformatically has been challenging because basically all of the reads map to both genes and essentially they were thrown out or doubly mapped. And so what Sarah did is she teamed up with Boris Brennerman um, from James Taylor's lab. And we just asked, okay, what can we do? And we literally counted every um, read that had one SNP or the other. So what you're looking at here is very raw data going from the five prime to the three prime of these mRNAs. And we're counting each read that had one or the other um, variant. In this case, we're just looking at the green. And what you can see with this heat map is that over time, post-conception, we start to see the green opsin being expressed. And then when we look at adult, we see that, and these are three different adults, that in individual adults, we see that the green opsin is expressed. It's a little variable between the adults, but ultimately it's expressed in all of these adults. So now we ask, okay, what's going on with the red opsin? Again, we had two main predictions. The first prediction is that, okay, if it's stochastic, it should show a similar pattern to the green opsin. But if it was temporal, maybe that either the red opsin will come on earlier or later than the green opsin. And so we looked for the red opsin. And indeed, what we saw now was we essentially saw no red opsin with only a trickle at the end of this uh, time period. And then when we looked at adults, we see that this red opsin is blazing. So together, this supported the idea that perhaps the green opsin is expressed first, the green cones are made first, followed by the red cones. But of course we have a, you know, a challenge here because we're kind of missing a lot of data. This is going into the third trimester. Uh, this, these samples are extremely, extremely rare and inaccessible. So to get at this, we asked the question in a different system. We said, okay, how can we, how can we kind of assess these late time points? So for this, we turned to a collaborator, Anna Latoura at uh, UC Davis. She's a fantastic, um, uh, vertebrate eye uh, developmental person. And she helped us to uh, study this in some monkeys in macaque, ma macaque primates. And with the idea that, you know, when we map out the developmental time, that the window we were looking at in humans was roughly this time window, whereas in macaque, we could have access to roughly this time window. And again, this is scaled linearly, so this may not perfectly match up. And keep in mind with all these, these are single time points of roughly staged tissue. So again, the time points may not match up perfectly. So what did we see? So we did the same kind of experiment. Oh, and just to, to mention again, even in macaque, these are highly similar with only, you know, kind of sparse differences. And what we saw kind of backed this up. Initially, at around day 90 post-conception, we see no expression of either opsin, but then we see very strong expression of the green opsin with a little bit of red opsin, which increases over time. Consistent with the idea that temporality is playing a big role in this process. And then in this case, green opsin is expressed more strongly than red opsin in the macaque. And so what the supported is this temporal model that there are blue cones and then green cones and then red cones. And I just wanna emphasize this, that this doesn't rule out the stochastic model by any means. Um, you know, development is already very noisy, um, but what this argues is that temporality is perhaps an underappreciated part of this developmental process. And so next, Sarah wanted to do is ask the question, well, what controls kind of the temporal choice between green and red cones? Um, so next, what we did is we turned to ideas from other species. And if you remember, I said this is a human-specific developmental trait, so we were kind of limited. Um, and again, you have the, the, the blue opsin gene and the red and the green. And by the way, the, the green can even have more than one copy. Um, but even New World monkeys, which are, are kind of our, the, the closest we can think about evolutionarily, they don't even have the same setup. Literally, these are different alleles of the same gene. So they don't even have this array of opsins. If we move out to mice, they don't have the red opsin. If we move out to chicken, they have similar arrangements with arrays of genes, but we don't really know anything about the mechanism. But then if you go all the way out to zebrafish, there are actually these arrays, and in the last few years, uh, different groups, particularly Debbie Stenkamp's group, has made progress in understanding how these arrays are controlled. And so what um, Debbie Stenkamp's group had shown is that early in development, there was expression of the second 
LWS option, LWS2 option, and that later in development, red nook acid was sufficient to drive LWS expression and repress LWS2. And interestingly, if you kind of map this to what it would look like in humans, well, in humans, we get expression of the second option first, early in development, and then later in development, we get expression of the first option in that array. So, you know, this raised the question, you know, does retinoic acid control red and green cone fates in humans? But before we get to this, Sarah had another challenge, which is, you know, we wanted to really visualize these options, you know, so we wondered how can we do this? Um, we've gotten a lot better at RNA fish and RNA ish types of uh, in situ approaches over the years, but this was truly challenging. So we turned to the, the RNA scope people and they said, okay, well, we've got this specialized version called base scope. Um, and essentially what this relies on are single probes that can detect basically three SNP differences in these two RNAs. And what these do is these probes lay down, you have a secondary probe that lays down and then you can, uh, you have this amplification system. And with this, you can march, mark individual RNAs. So to validate this system, what Sarah did was she said, okay, let's take this into a heterologous system into HEC-293 cells. In our negative control, we don't see expression of either option. If she transfected just the blue, again, with all of these, she's doing the double in situ. So the red and the blue in situ here. And I just wanna emphasize here, the, the, just because of the nature of the assay, here we're gonna say that the, the red option is the L option, that's the official name. The green option is the M option and the green will appear as a slightly blue shade. So she put in the M or green option cDNA and now what she saw were these cells, nice expression of this, um, of this option. When she transfected in just the L or the red option, she just saw expression of the L option. When she did a really nice experiment where she independently transfected these in independent cells and then mixed the cells what she saw was exclusive expression of the red or the green option. And then finally, if she co-transfected, she could see co-expression in the form of these not so beautiful uh, black cells. So, all right. And, oh, and by the way, she's more recently been applying this to the human retina. And what you're looking at here is human retinal tissue in which she's staining for individual cone cells in the human retina. Um, and she's able to count the different proportions of cone cells in the human retina. So, all right, now she has the tools because she can now visualize this. And she next wondered, does retinoic acid control red and green cone fates in humans? And so what she initially started with is our standard conditions. So in our standard conditions, we differentiate organoids to about day 43. And then we essentially only have uh, grow them in regular media. But for the first um, out to day 130, we actually include retinoic acid. This is in our standard uh, conditions. In the first part of my talk, these are the, the type of approaches we use with these organoids. And what, what you saw under these conditions were that they essentially only made green cells. And here's the representative image. Um, and you know, for a long time, we were worried about this. And so what she did next was she said, okay, well, if retinoic acid is playing a role, perhaps if we just extended this window a bit, we could get some cells. And indeed she saw a little bit of red cells, but nothing too impressive. So next she thought, what if we extend this for the whole time? What if we have retinoic acid treatment throughout development? And in this case, it made these organoids very sick. So we saw a significant loss of green and red cones. So to kind of get around this issue, what she next did was she said, okay, what if we now just add retinoic acid late in development? And now what she saw was a dramatic phenotype where um, nearly every cone um, of the red and green cones were now a red cone. And here's a representative image here. So this was cool. So what we can very confidently con uh, conclude is that retinoic acid signaling plays a role in the specification of green and red cones. But if you look a little more closely at the data, it's not totally clear how it's doing it. So meaning, you know, if we add retinoic acid early, we essentially get green cones. If we add retinoic acid late, we essentially only get red cones. So which is doing the job or is both? So moving forward, what, we're, what Sarah is doing experiments now to address is, okay, is it that retinoic acid is promoting green fate early and repressing red fate, or is retinoic acid promoting red fate late and repressing green fate? So this is kind of the last big 
puzzle question that she's addressing right now. And to do this, she's growing organoids grown with no RA with the hopes to kind of see like the baseline of what would happen with these organoids when there is no RA in the media. Additionally, what she's doing is doing a timeline looking at red and green opsin expression in organoids over time to see again if this recapitulates what we see with the real fetal human um, uh, expression data. And you know, these experiments take a long time. I always have to give credit to Sarah and all the members of my lab because these experiments are very arduous. Um, it takes real kick-ass scientists to do this. And we'll know the answer to this on January 10th. So um, we're really looking forward to that day coming soon. So, all right. So I don't want to leave you on a cliffhanger. I do, I, I do want to give you some other data that supports this conclusion. So what other evidence do we have that retinoic acid plays a role in red and green cone subtype specification? So for this, again, we turn to ideas from natural variation, and we teamed up with a bunch of great colleagues, uh, Maureen and Jay Knights at University of Washington, James Taylor, Rajiv McCoy, and Mike Soria at Johns Hopkins. And what we thought is, and what we knew from the work of Jay and Maureen, is that there's a huge variation between people that are color vision normal. And this can vary from one to three, in other words, one red cone to three green cones, to one to one, to even 17 to one. And we thought, could we take advantage of this natural variation in human cone subtype ratios? And so to get at this, what we did is we sampled about 750 or so people and we got their, uh, Jay and Maureen got their red green ratios. And in particular, we did this exclusively in males because we wanted to limit variation as this opsin locus is on the X chromosome. So we thought, okay, single uh, gene copy, perhaps this would limit the variation. And because we were interested in non-coding mutations, we did a pull down method to pull down genes of interest. And so next we do is we sequence these and then we did an association study focusing on the red green locus and about 20 candidate genes. And so our main thing was thinking, okay, what are we gonna find in the red green locus? So we look at this Manhattan plot and we see as the red green locus is over here, we don't really see any uh, kind of stark candidates. But what jumped out to us later as, you know, well, not later, as we were looking at this data is this SNP here. And this is a significant SNP falling in the uh, NR2F2 gene. And interestingly, um, so this is just showing the genotypes. You know, if we have this one variant homozygous, we see this ratio down to the homozygous of the other variant. And interestingly, NR2F2 is an orphan nuclear receptor, but it's known to mediate uh, retinoic acid signaling. Um, and it's been shown in many contexts to do so. So this is an intriguing link, but we still have a lot of work to do. And what we're doing now is we're taking in the next steps to validate this variant and test the role of NR2F2 specifically in our system. So just to conclude this section, what I've shown you is that there appears to be an important role for temporal specification of cones in human retinal development that retinoic acid signaling specifies red versus green cones, though we're still trying to figure out how it's doing that job. And this suggests an interesting uh, example, perhaps, of convergent evolution of the uh, regulation of opsin expression in the visual system. And just to conclude broadly, uh, hopefully what I convince you today is that temporal specification um, is uh, a broad mechanism used in the human retina to generate the cones in our eyes. And, you know, we have a lot of outstanding questions we're working on. In particular now, you know, within the eye, what controls the thyroid hormone signaling and the RA signaling? You know, how are specialized regions like the fovea and the macula in the eye generated? You know, how can we use these organoids for transplantation? And finally, we're exploring how other cell types are specified in the eye. And in particular, we started new projects looking at retinal ganglion cells that connect the eye to the brain. And just to conclude broadly, I'll take it back to where I started, is that, you know, the different types of neurons in our nervous system is a, fa a, a fascinating question. It's a huge puzzle. And hopefully what I've convinced you is that human retinal organoids are a way that we can, over time now, figure out how all the neurons of the human retina are generated. So to conclude, I'd like to thank you, first off, for all of your attention. Um, I'll thank my collaborators, James Taylor, Boris Brennerman, Carl Whalen, Don Zach, Jay Knights, Maureen Knights, uh, Rajiv McCoy and Mike Surya, but especially I want to thank Kiara Eldred, a fantastic grad student, a uh, former grad student in the lab, and also Sarah Hadniak, who really had tremendous courage to pursue this 
really crazy project, really testing very human specific um, developmental processes. And with that, uh, thank you again. I'll take any questions. All right. Looks like we have a question in the chat. Oh, I have a question. Hi, Dijem. Go ahead. Hi, hi, Bob. Thanks. Uh, nice, very nice talk. Um, so I actually I have a question for for both decision one and decision two, but I'll, I'll focus on my question for decision two first. Um, uh -huh. So so you you bring up you framed it as 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 having these two broad possible models. One where you have a stochastic model versus. Uh, a temporal model, and then and then you did mention that that they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, such that there's still stochastic. So I was wondering, from the data you showed, it seems possible you could envision a model where it is stochastic, and that the first decision that happens is the green is the green decision, and that retinoic acid uh, directly uh, ha has some sort of uh, input into the probability of that first decision happening. And that if that decision doesn't happen, then that opens up the possibility of the red gene being expressed. And then that is also directly regulated by that late retinoic acid. So could it be possible that in neither case does retinoic acid rep directly repress the possibility of expressing either the red gene early or the green gene late? but that it's only activating in both cases and it's just simply a question of timing. And if you make that first stochastic decision to express green, you won't get red. But if you miss that decision, then retinoic acid can induce the expression of the red gene. Yeah, so I partially agree with you, um, meaning that I, we definitely have not ruled out stochastic features, but ultimately um, kind of like you were mentioning, you know, ultimately if there is a temporal, there's two things that support this temporal model, right? the differential response to retinoic acid, but also just the observations we see, particularly from the fetal human tissue in terms of the opsin expression. But again, I completely agree with you that we have not, and I don't, by any means, I don't wanna say that we ruled it out. I just wanna more emphasize the temporal side of things that um, indeed what it could be is some kind of complex interaction, meaning that there's a temporal aspect, but this also intersects with the stochastic part. Um, ultimately, to get at that, what we need is many more timelines, um, and we're just getting there. So um, stay tuned. We'll find out, you know, especially as we, you know, I, can't, I think the, the experiments that Sarah is finishing up now are really going to be key because she's getting a timeline in the organoid. So in other words, will we see like green cones at a certain population? And, um, you know, because then we can actually quantify them. We've done some of this in fetal tissue, but not in terms of the red green choice. And again, getting fetal tissue to do these tests directly to visually see it are challenging. But yeah, I, I agree with you that we, we definitely, and I just wanna emphasize again and again that we haven't ruled out the stochastic model by any means. The, the main thing that we have done, I think though, is shown that there's a key temporal feature. Yeah, I, I think that's clear. So I, I just want, if I may just ask one one quick question about the- Yeah, fire away. The, the, um... So does the does THR beta directly activate and or repress either the blue or red green plus like clusters? Yeah, so this is a great question. We haven't addressed that at all. We've I've always kind of been an upstream uh, biologist, you know, kind of working from the bottom and if I can move my way up, but this is kind of the one of the one of the next big questions on the on the list that we want to get at for multiple reasons. One is the you know, I was saying about the blue versus red green option. But the thing is, and I, didn't, I kind of didn't talk about this, but they are morphologically different also. So there's a whole part of biology there that we don't know anything about. You know, how are these two different cells that are key to how we see the world, how are they different? You know, and how does this mechanism control it? The, so your question is, is spot on, and these are questions we want to look at in the future. Um, I have a question. Yeah, fire away. Um, Speaking of upstream biology, um, so when you're looking at this, when you're thinking about this temporal model and saying like, okay, early conditions um, promote uh, blue cells and later conditions promote green and later promote red, that to me raises the question of like, all of those cells are still making the decision of like whether or not to differentiate. So do you know anything about like 
why some of the cells are differentiating in response to the signal and some not? Are they just taking like a wide range of times to mature or? Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's a very complex question. I appreciate it. So let me just tell you a little bit about what we know. So what Christina in the lab has been doing is she's actually been doing some nice uh, expression analysis, looking at that DIO2 and DIO3. And I'll just focus on decision one. But basically what she sees is that the retinal precursors cells themselves express the DIO3, which uh, degrades the thyroid hormone. So what we think is happening is you have a high population of progenitor cells and that over time they start differentiating and that relieves this repression of the thyroid hormone signaling. Interestingly, what she sees is that the photoreceptors seem to then start expressing DIO2, which then activates the thyroid hormone. So we think we are getting kind of two effects, right? You're depleting the pool of the, de the degrading enzyme, and then you're increasing the pool of cells expressing the activating enzyme. So of course, this then are in itself is linked to proliferation and differentiation itself. Um, on top of that, we have uh, Chiara did some timelines with thyroid hormone signaling. And what we see is that we can actually induce some of these cell fates early if we add thyroid hormone signaling early. And how that's working, we don't really understand. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, can I ask a question from the first part of your talk? Yeah, of course. Um, so the question was, which are the cells that are expressing the enzymes that could modify thyroid hormone one way or the other. And it seems like one attractive model is a quorum sensing model, that it's the blue cones that are making it. And as soon as you get a critical number of them, you then switch over to the other type. Is that, do, do, does the, do the methods you have have the ability to detect the fact without a single cell approach that it's happening in the blue cones? Yes, yeah, so this is a very interesting thing. So again, this comes to Christina's work. Um, and she literally had her first thesis meeting, uh, I guess it was yesterday. Wow, yeah, days are different now. Um, and indeed, this is exactly what we think we see. It's still early days, so we'll find out. But what she sees is that blue, it seems like all photoreceptors, amongst which blue cones are the first ones, express this DIO2. So it's exactly what we think is that you're creating these cells that are expressing this DIO2 enzyme, and then it somehow, you know, gets above a threshold where it says, okay, now any new guys are gonna um, uh, become the red green cells. But of course, you know, we're, we're still far away from proving that. The expression data makes sense, but you know, what she's doing now is she's gonna be make, using CRISPR to make mutants and doing um, viral methods to do uh, kind of temporal experiments to test that hypothesis. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So are there um, human patients with non-coding regulatory mutations um, that are colorblind that might shed insight into the upstream mechanisms? Yeah, great question. So at uh, Jeremy and others, particularly the Knights, uh, for example, they've studied a lot with that LCR region. So people that have a mutation that removes the locus control region lack both red and green vision. So they're called blue, um, uh, blue cone monochromats. Um, but there's a lot of questions with that that we could address with the system, which people don't know, right? Is, you know, how many cones do you even have then? Do those cones die? Do they convert into blue cones? Um, so one thing that's on our list is to then make knockouts of that LCR and see what happens to the cone fates. But again, you know, the, the puzzle of the cell fate, especially downstream, like what does that, how and what does thyroid hormone control is still a very open question. Okay. Can I ask a question too? Yeah. Hey, Roberto. Yeah. May, may you mention. Great seeing you, man. <laughs> How much plasticity is in there? Like, for example, is there a window of time between which a red cone can switch to blue, or maybe if you do a selective ablation of one type, do you see that another type can compensate? Uh, yeah. Very generally. Yeah. Yeah. So the second question we haven't addressed yet, and we want to do by, for example, taking either. Ideally, we do it with CRISPR, but perhaps with virus system, viral systems, is to use the promoters, like for the blue cones, and just kill them by ectopically expressing backs or something like that. But we haven't done those experiments yet. Um, another one we're setting up to do is to use a viral system to use the blue promoter to drive like a 
again, we don't have like locks, Cree lock systems. You know, these are not, there's no genetics, right? <laughs> um, so one thing we're doing though, is setting up to, to take the, the blue uh, option enhancer and drive like a histone RFP. So it should be pretty long lived. So then we can track, you know, what happens to the fate of that cell over time. What I will tell you is we are seeing some really cool things with thyroid hormone. So what we can do is we actually let the organoid grow when it's terminally differentiated. So we have a mix of blue and red green cells, and then we can pulse for just 10 days of thyroid hormone. And we can see that the blue cones start to express red green opsin. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And so what we, what we were wondering is a couple of things is, is this a normal part of development? There's some evidence again from Anita Hendrickson and others that there is a phase where some blue cones express red green. So we wonder, is there a subpopulation that does that? And then the other thing that's really cool, and again, there's so many questions that we just don't, you know, um, is there's a disease called Graves' disease. It's a um, hyperthyroid disease. And what's interesting is, um, again, it's a hyperthyroid hormone disease. And these people, one of the first things that leads to diagnosis is defects in color vision. And so, what, you know, what we want to do is kind of do either long range experiments in these organoids or get samples. Um, you know, the, the, the good news for health is that uh, thyroid hormone uh, problems are very treatable. So that's the good news for people. Like, I'm very happy for people. Uh, the bad news for us is because it's thyroid hormone disorders are treatable is it's hard for us to get a tissue in which it's, you know, had problems for a long time. Um, so these are exactly the kind of questions we get at. Thank you so much for the question. Thanks. I have a question from the first half. Yeah, sure, Tyler. Back to the, the diversity in these tissues and animals like the zebrafish and fly that you showed us. I looked quickly and saw that thyroid hormone does affect zebrafish retina cell fate decisions, but I'm wondering about the fly or other invertebrates. Does like juvenile hormone or any of their steroid hormones control these fine level fate decisions in their retina? Uh so not that we know of, um, the one that I personally tested, I tested, it's around the time point I've tested a Dyson receptor, um, and it doesn't affect the fate choice. Um, it does affect like uh, properties of the cells, like their development, but it doesn't affect the fate choice per se. In terms of the timing, um, we've done a lot of work. We, we have uh, outstanding, still we do a lot of fly work in the lab because um, the fly stuff is truly stochastic. We've, we've shown this, others have shown this, that the relationship of those two cell types is truly stochastic. So it's a really cool system to study how cells randomly choose fates. And what we found without going into a ton of detail, so actually uh, Matthias Vernet, when he was in Claude Desplan's lab, found this transcription factor called spineless um, that controls this choice. And we followed up on the regulation of spineless. And what it seems like it's doing is it's a dynamic relationship where this gene is at a closed chromatin state. It's then expressed in all the cells to open and then it, the chromatin invariably closes where some cells will close and forever be off and other cells will be on. Um, yeah, so that's just in a nutshell what we're studying in, the, in terms of that question. But uh, to get back to your original question, we haven't found any direct relationship of hormone regulation in flies for that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you again. Thank you so much Bud, for a wonderful seminar. Thank you. Um, and I'm handing over to Maya Emmonsbell. So she will host you for the student social. And thanks again for doing all this. Thank you. Uh, I really, really appreciate this. It was this a real pleasure awesome. to Thank talk you. to you and to listen to your seminar. So I'm going to exit <laughs> and hand over to Maya as make her the host. I think and, and yeah, Maya, any, any students or postdocs, I'm already a host. Yeah. Anyone who wants to stick around to chat with Bob, um, feel free. I'm gonna stop the recording now. Thanks, Gal, thank you.